Now as we look at all this, it actually relates in some interesting ways to uh, the history of the just war tradition in philosophy. And this tradition goes back uh, at least to, to St. Augustine um, in kind of the very early part uh, or just before the Middle Ages. And the notion here is that you know, war is not a good thing. Uh, war produces all kinds of terrible effects, but sometimes war is necessary. And in fact, sometimes war is even just. And from a moral perspective, we want to try to um, assess war and decide, you know, is this just? Is this uh, appropriate to pursue? Uh, and there's two, two parts to this. One is um, use ad bellum, and one is use in bellum. Use is justice, and bellum is, is war. And so use ad bellum is the idea of what are the criteria for justice in entering into a war, and use in bellum is what are the criteria for justice in pursuing a war. So uh, these kind of classical philosophical norms find their way into uh, contemporary instruments of international law. So use ad bellum, we find a lot of these principles in the UN Charter, which we're going to talk about in just a moment. So some of the basic principles. War has to be prosecuted by a just, competent authority. Now notice here how some of these principles uh, relate to, or how, how some of Clausewitz's views about war relate to these principles, right? So there's a governing authority, a rational authority, a competent authority that's acting justly to govern and discipline all this. There has to be a just cause for the war. There has to be a just intention in pursuing that cause. So it's not just a case that there's some theoretically just cause, but the intent is really to do something else that is actually unjust. And war is supposed to be a last resort. So every other uh, peaceable, diplomatic, other kinds of means to resolve whatever conflict has arisen uh, ought to be exhausted before a resort to war. Use in bello, the justice, uh, just proper action in the prosecution of a war, we can find a lot of these historic norms in instruments such as the Hague Convention and the Hague Conventions and the Geneva Conventions. So these will include distinction. So we are supposed to distinguish combatants from non-combatants. So if you are a uh, military participant, then you can be subject to the violence of war. But if you are a civilian and not a military p participant, um, steps are supposed to be taken to try to insulate you from the direct effects of the war. Necessity, the means employed should only be such as are necessary to achieve uh, the, the just cause. So, uh, you know, if the just cause is to recover some small piece of territory, uh, you, don't, you know, you don't drop nuclear weapons, things like that. Humanity, the means pursued, ought to uh, take into account the humanity of the other side. The other side remain human beings with uh, certain kinds of human and moral rights, even if they are subject to the violence of war. And proportionality, the means pursued should be proportionate uh, to the cause and, and to the conflict itself. So all of the use ad bellum principles are designed to mitigate the possibility of nations entering into a war, and all of the use in bello uh, principles are designed to mitigate the effects and the extent of war in the event that it does have to be entered into. So how do these uh, principles find their way into international law. We talked uh, over the past couple of weeks about uh, the very beginnings of sort of what we would think of as modern international law, kind of back to the uh, Peace of Westphalia after the Thirty Years' War, and we talked about Napoleonic Wars and World War I, the League of Nations, and then World War II, and after World War II, we have the UN Charter. And the UN Charter, as we said, is a, a treaty uh, organization, the UN is a treaty organization, and its really primary mission after World War II was to try to prevent another instance of what was either total war or close to total war, which was World War II. So again, see the, ref the sort of reference to Clausewitz, the effort to constrain the, the totalizing effects of war. So uh, Article Two of the UN Charter lays out the broad general principle, which is that disputes should be resolved peaceably and not through violent means. So UN Article 2 lays out the general principle 
which is that disputes are supposed to be resolved peaceably. Members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force. Now, in a sense, this is um, contrary to what Clausewitz said, or at least it recognizes what Clausewitz said, is that war is a form of politics by another means. And the idea here is, let's do politics on the peaceable side of the scale, not on the violent side of the scale. Nevertheless, within the UN Charter, there are two broad exceptions to this principle of nonviolence. One of them uh, is when military action is authorized by the UN Security Council, and the second one is the general international law principle of self-defense, and we'll talk about both of those. So first, the UN Security Council. I'm sure you've heard of the Security Council in the news, news and so on. What is the Security Council? It is one of the six main organs or bodies of the United Nations established in the UN Charter. So those include, those are the General Assembly, the Security Council, Economic and Social Council, the Trusteeship Council, the International Court of Justice, which has been in the news a bit lately, and the Secretariat. Now, uh, the Security Council has five permanent members, China, France, the Russian Federation, the United Kingdom, and the US. You can see from the makeup of these, except for China, uh, that they reflect kind of the balance of uh, power uh, after World War II, of course, excluding uh, the losing side, which is Germany. Uh, and then, of course, China added in recognition of, of China's uh, size and influence as a, an international power. There are 10 non-permanent members of the Security Council who are elected to two-year terms. If you look on the UN's website, you can see who those are and, and who those have been. Now, um, you know, very important is to uh, see how the Security Council works in that uh, it really requires consensus and it requires um, this mix of countries to agree on a, on a policy to pursue. So the Security Council will determine if there is a threat to the peace, uh, a breach of the peace or an act of aggression, and can then uh, determine what action ought to be taken. And an important thing to note here is that all of the other organs of the UN only make recommendations. The Security Council makes decisions that the members must carry out, uh, ultimately possibly on, on, on pain of being removed from the, from the UN. The various things that the Security Council can uh, decide are, are set forth in Articles 41 and 42, so they can include uh, ceasefires, sanctions. You've seen a lot of things about economic sanctions um, in the news lately. A blockade or even collective military action. So kind of the blue helmeted UN troops or other kinds of collective military action. Article 51 sets out the second, uh, second exception which is really codifying a uh, principle of customary international law. Uh, international law is, one, is a really interesting sort of creature in that you have positive international law which is encoded and you have customary international law which is um, not as formal as, as positive law but is recognized as part of the traditional conduct, historical conduct of nations and then finds its way sometimes into the official code. So notice here that uh, Article 51 states that every nation has the right of self-defense and can use force in self-defense. Now a uh, key phrase in this is that you can use collective self-defense if an armed attack occurs against you. Um, now there is also a principle that uh, kind of in the jurisprudence of this that you don't necessarily have to wait till the attack is launched. So certainly if another nation is, is firing rockets into your territory, you can respond appropriately. Um, on the other hand, if the troops are simply massed at the border uh, and it's, it's evident that they're prepared to invade, you don't necessarily have to wait for the invasion. You can strike first in that instance because it's an imminent attack. But either way, it has to be uh, a, a, a happening, currently happening, or an imminent armed attack. 
So this raises uh, a really key question for us concerning the international law of war and cyberspace, which is what is an armed attack in cyberspace? Uh, the language that is used in the UN Charter, the history of the UN Charter, all has to do with uh, soldiers carrying, you know, rifles, people firing missiles and howitzers, tanks rolling over the border, planes dropping bombs. It has to do with the kind of warfare uh, that we were familiar with from World War II. Now, certainly during World War II, there were electronic operations, you're jamming radar and things like that. Uh, there were psychological and propaganda operations, but the focus of the UN Charter and the Law of Wars is on real kinetic warfare. How do we apply that today? There really are, in the literature, in the scholarship, there are three main schools of thought about how we might do this. Now, these aren't the only possibilities, but these are sort of how scholars in the area see the ideas coalescing. So. One is an instrument-based approach, and the idea here is uh, if you look at the, uh, the attack that has occurred, would you say that the same damage could have been achieved with a purely kinetic attack? So let's say that somebody launches uh, something like the Stuxnet virus or, or a, a virus similar to that which messes with the control system of a power plant, causes the reactor to overheat, and it explodes. Could you have achieved that? Uh, without using cyber. You could have, right? You could have planted a bomb. In that case, uh, it would qualify. A second perspective, which is a little bit broader, is effects or consequence based. So here you would say, what were the overall effects of the attack? Of the attack? Now, it may be that some aspects of the attack could only have been carried out by cyber. Um, but nevertheless, the overall effects are similar to a kinetic type of, of effect. In other words, it causes some physical damage, loss of life, physical injury, things like that. A third approach is even broader. The third approach is a strict liability approach. So the third approach would say any cyber attack against critical infrastructure would automatically be considered equivalent to an armed attack because critical infrastructure by definition is critical uh, and it's vulnerable and so therefore we should think about a cyber attack on that kind of infrastructure as an act of war. Uh, like I said, there's no one way to look at this. Uh, a number of scholars whom I've read seem to favor the effects-based approach, and uh, perhaps there's some very general consensus around that, but all of these approaches are viable, and you know, this is a thing we can talk about when we meet together in class.